finishing up our summer study, and so we're going to be looking at the end of Matthew chapter 7. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount all uh, summer long, and we did it. We reached the end of summer, and thus it's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, we'll be starting a brand new series, and we'll be looking at living out our best life. This past summer, we've been resetting some of these things that we thought we knew, and then replacing them with Jesus' teaching. And Jesus is now standing on the hillside, he's preaching to everyone, and he's hoping to correct a lot of misinformation that was floating around. Jesus is going to close it all out today with some sound advice. He says in verse 24, Everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So Jesus says, in closing, right, two things. If after listening to this sermon, if you want to be wise, number one, hear these words, and number two, put them into practice, right? can't just listen, because like we say, in one ear, out the other. Also, we say a foolish person doesn't learn from their mistakes, but rather a wise person learns from their mistakes. My dad used to say that an even wiser person learns from the mistakes of others. Yes. And Jesus says, an even wiser person than that hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. There are even books in the Bible that we call the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes. These books contain all the collective wisdom of many of the godly men and women who lived back in the Old Testament. And when they write, they invite all of us to read and to live wisely. In fact, this is how the book of Psalms begins in chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does he prospers. The writer of the Psalms reminds us trees are dependent on rain for growth just as you are dependent on God's word for spiritual growth. But trees can't water themselves. They are not responsible even for where they got planted. So unless by some freak accident they are planted by a busy stream, they need attention, so the tree is dependent on rain. Just like babies, they're dependent on their parents to feed them. Newborns can't walk to food. They can't get into the cupboard. They can't spoon it into their mouths. So blessed are the parents whose children know how to pour their own breakfast cereal. <laughs> All summer long, my two boys sat around the house, an entire summer of staying indoors. Unless mom or dad drug them out of the house, they wanted to stay inside. Which is weird to me, because I remember in the summer wanting nothing more than to get out of the house and to stay outside from sunrise to sunset. This week, uh, Declan walked to Walden Market for the first time. I said, get out of the house, take money, leave. <laughs> he said, what if I get hit by a car crossing Walden Road? I said, I'm willing to take that risk. <laughs> and you know what? He enjoyed the experience. But not only that, he was encouraged that same week to get out and to walk even further. Most Christians depend on rain to fall. They need something to encourage them at just the right time. But the psalmist says the wise Christian plants themselves in the word of God so that no matter what eternal forces are at work, they still grow. Because they are responsible. They feed themselves. They don't wait for rain to fall. They don't wait for circumstances. They don't wait for the next big church program to feed themselves. Did you know that most church programs don't even grow your church? They don't even grow the Christian. It's true. In fact, in all the studies they've done, 
connected to church growth or spiritual maturity, there's no connection between church programs and spiritual growth. Isn't that depressing? It's just like the Olympics. Maybe your household is like mine. You've been watching the Olympics uh, this week. Those athletes, they're incredible. This is Caleb Dressel. He got five gold medals this year. I think they said that he got a gold medal in every single event he entered. Uh, Greg Troy is his coach. Now, I'm sure Mr. Troy spoke to Caleb about technique and what to do. I'm sure he spoke to him about how to get the most pull from every stroke. Coach Troy, I'm sure, has spent hours talking to Caleb Dressel about swimming. But tell me something. And while I'm sure that Coach Troy's advice was wise and it was good counsel, it was full of great information, does information alone make you a gold medalist? No. No, Caleb gets up at 7 in the morning, he has breakfast, and he jumps in the pool for two hours. Then he goes to the weight room and works out for two hours, and then has lunch. And then he goes back to the pool for two hours, and then has dinner. Caleb said, practice does take a lot out of me because I have to be on it for every stroke, every turn, every breakout, anything I do, I want to be as focused as I can. Caleb went to the Olympics this year and won five gold medals because he trains for six hours a day every single day. His coach helped, the gym helped, having a pool to train in, that helps, but it's not gonna be enough. To be successful, to maximize your ability, to grow, to mature, you need to spend time training. So decide for yourself, I'm gonna grow. Another passage on growth that we've read these past couple weeks is John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove be my disciples. It's a very similar sounding passage. Jesus says those who abide produce fruit. Disciples of Jesus produce fruit. We talked about being a disciple last week, but how do disciples grow? What is the one thing that would help a Christian grow? You know, that question was asked of those same Christian researchers. They said, okay, so if programs don't do it, what does it? They talked to some people who said they felt more spiritually mature. And they asked them, how did you get there? What helps Christians grow in their faith? Is it more Bible studies? Is it more church attendance? Is it more of memorizing scripture? How do we become more like Jesus? Friend, I, I think we live so far below from where we could be in Christ. Even as Christians, I think we tend to accept all of our laws, we tend to accept all of our sins, and we're aware of it, but at the same time, we're kind of okay with it. Whether we're self-centered, whether we're prideful, whether we have bursts of anger, maybe we don't experience the joy we could, or the peace we could, or the love we could, hasn't God created us to live in a whole different way? To live more like Jesus? To be more like Jesus? What if we decided to find nourishment and feed ourselves? What if we, like the wise tree, decided to plant ourselves by the river? What if we would hear these words of Jesus and put them in practice, like he says, to be the wise person? Are we content with our spiritual level of maturity? Or do you want all that life has for you, all that God has for you? What needs to change? I said earlier, most church programs don't work. They don't cause people to change. They don't cause people to mature. And so those Christian researchers, they set out to find, okay, so where are the people that feel close to God? And what would they say got them there? Listen to what people who had grown spiritually said about their lives. They felt the genuine presence of God in their lives. Their religious experiences were a source of strength, personal growth, and helped them heal inner conflict. They had a greater sense of peace, felt joy, and happy, and less depressed. They were humble. They found themselves far more involved with helping others. They found it easier and quicker to forgive. And you know what the secret was? 
And, th and those sound like great qualities, and we listed some of those when we were talking about discipleship, but what does it take to get there? What's the answer? There was one answer to the majority of the, those people that were asked, the one consistent answer. Are you ready? I reflect on the meaning of Scripture and reflect on it daily or multiple times a week. Meditating on it. Reflecting on it. That was the number one cause of Christian growth. Philippians 4 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And it shouldn't really be a surprise to us, because this is how Jesus lived. And, and it's what Jesus says here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. What do we see Jesus do? He prays, he reads and reflects on God's word, he follows the guidance of the Spirit, he slows down his pace of life so that he can impact people, so that he can serve people, and we see him worship. And these practices don't stop. We don't quit, no matter what external thing is happening in our lives. And so we're going to close out today on this idea of thinking about these true and noble things. Or as the Bible puts it, meditating on God's Word. The Bible is more than just ancient history. It's more than just Middle Eastern uh, history of a group of people that called the Israelites. It's even more than a story about Jesus. The Bible is God's self-revelation to us. And when I say revelation, I'm not talking about the book at the end of the Bible. I'm talking about how God reveals himself to humanity. This is how God talks about himself. This is how he communicates who he is to us. God interacted with people, and that inspired people, and they wrote down what God said and what God did. 2 Timothy says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So in the Bible, we have a record of everything we need to know about how to have a relationship with God and how to live the way that he created us to live. By reading God's word, we know how to grow. And we know who God is. Remember, wisdom is the tree that plants themselves by the river. But for most people, they are content to wait for rain. Wait for the pastor to tell them. Wait for the radio. Wait for that next book author to write another book. But God has already revealed himself, and it's in a book that you already own. And if we rely on other people to tell us about God, then you are only going to get a partial picture of who God is. It's like waiting for your dad to give you your $5 allowance at the end of the week. Or you can decide one day, I'm going to put my own boots on, I'm going to go and get a job for myself, and I'm going to make 20 times as much. You own a Bible. Go to the source daily, weekly. Are you content with your spiritual growth? Are you hungry to dig deeper, to grow more? Do you want to mature? The answer doesn't lie in, you know what, maybe we'll just try a different church. Or let's just sing different songs. Or let's do more programs. Or let's do more Bible study. The answer lies in, I reflect on the meaning of Scripture and reflect on it daily or multiple times a week. You get to know this God. You get to love this God and worship Him. And through this love letter that we call the Bible, you grow Remember those old uh, What Would Jesus Do bracelets? It was WWJD. Author Charles Sheldon, he wrote a book that inspired people to ask, okay, in this situation, the answer for my action or my decisions should be Christ-like, so I should ask myself, in this situation, what would Jesus do? It's a good idea. But tell me something. How would you know what Jesus did if you don't know what Jesus did? Do you know Jesus? Have you spent time in Scripture and meditated on him this week? 65% of all Christians have never read through the entire New Testament. 65%! Not the entire Bible, just the back half. I mean, we all know the stories in the Old Testament, like Noah's, and, and Abraham and Isaac, and David and Goliath, and Daniel the lion's den, and Adam and Eve. But do we understand the big picture? 
nature of God's word. Some people have attended church their entire lives, and they've never read or studied Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Just to give you an example, just to give you an example of this, Ephesians 2 says, For as by grace you have been saved by faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. This is a verse that some Christians still don't understand, that you don't have to work for or earn your salvation. Can you imagine trying to work for heaven? Or trying to endure the stress of sin and guilt without knowing that you are saved by grace? How would you know? We just hope and wait for the pastor to read that subject on that Sunday that you attend that church? No, instead you decide, I'm going to be a wise tree. I'm going to plant myself down next to the stream of flowing water. Because the word of God feeds me. The word of God feeds me. Listen, it's simple. The Bible nourishes us and helps us grow. Much like food or exercise, we need it, and without it, we can stay the same, or we can get worse. And when we're not reading God's word, then we're not allowing God to speak to us. It's the only word of God that we have. Aside from your prayer life, this is where God reveals himself to us. And if it is the only word of God you receive is what you receive on a Sunday morning, then you are starving yourself spiritually six days a week. When Jesus had fasted in the desert for 40 days, the devil came to tempt him, and he said, turn these stones into bread if you're hungry. And Jesus could have done it, but instead he responded back with scripture. He said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We eat three times a day, and probably we snack in between those just to push hunger away. But how often are we feeding on the word of God? Because it's impossible to grow spiritually without taking more of it in. And then the word of God will transform me. The word of God transforms me. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. See, the author of Hebrews argues that the Bible is not some old-fashioned, dusty book written thousands of years ago, and it doesn't apply to our lives today. The Bible is the inspired word of God, and it is living, and it is active. When you open the Bible, God is speaking to you. And it's God's living word. And it penetrates into your heart. It goes into your soul like a sword. And it's like a scalpel that cuts away with precision. When we read God's word, we read about people who are just like us. I mean, sure, they lived thousands of years ago. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have cars. But they were just like us. Sometimes we read a story where we think, Man, that person is self-centered, just like us. Man, that person is, has fits of angry, or that person has you know, trouble in their marriage, or that person has annoying kids, just like us. Right? But it transforms you, and you crack it open, and you reflect on it, and you allow God's word to penetrate you, and you grow spiritually, and then you begin to see those ways in which we draw closer to God. Anyone can crack a Bible open and read it, but we have to read it so that we grow spiritually, we allow God to transform us, and then we meditate on it through our day and through our week. We ask ourselves questions. We dialogue with other people about what we read. Read the book of Psalms. How often do you hear the psalmist write, I will meditate on your statutes. I will meditate on your decrees. I will meditate on your commandments. Meditating is a lot like worry, right? How do you, how do you act when you worry? You, you, you think about something a lot, and it takes up space in your head. And when you are a little bit distracted and you kind of have a moment to go back, you think, oh yeah, I was worrying about this. Meditating or reflecting is thinking about God's word in a way that it just consumes your thoughts. It's that thought in the back of your mind. You're allowing God to speak to you. You're allowing God to fill your thoughts and to mold your thinking to be like his. What was the popular key that people said made them feel closer to God? I reflect 
a meaning of scripture and I reflect on it daily or multiple times a week, the more our thoughts are changed to be like God, then our character and then our actions will follow. Jesus said, hear these words of mine and, right, and put them into practice. People have said to me, I don't read the Bible because uh, I just don't understand it. Or, you know, it's old. Or it's boring. Or it's hard to relate to. Okay, I, I understand. I know the Bible can be difficult to read at times, but some of those difficulties can go away if I just spend more time in it. So my, my first suggestion is always get a Bible that you can read. Now, I know you have your grandmother's Bible still and it has a lot of meaning to you, but you should probably go to the Bible bookstore and find a translation that you can read and understand. People will always ask me, what's the best translation of the Bible? The best translation of the Bible is the one you'll read. Something that you can follow. And if you need notes and study notes, then get those. Or get a daily devotional. Get a devotional you've never read before. Something in paperback, something in print. I know you've got one on your Kindle, but a physical book with a bookmark will be a visual reminder of something to go back to. And then before you sit down to do your devotional, before you sit down to do your uh, Bible reading, just spend some time in prayer. Use that as an opportunity to have a moment of prayer for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit. Say, I'm going to begin to read God's Word. Holy Spirit, reveal to me something in this that I need to hear today. And then after you read, do the same thing. Quiet yourself. Allow that inner voice to speak. Listen. Think about the truth you read. Ponder it. Ask, what is God trying to tell me? Is God revealing himself in some way? I had a teacher in the seminary who began every single class reading a scripture. He didn't follow a pattern. He just read some random verse, and then he just stared at us in silence. And he said, God's word does not go out void. So what I read has meaning, and we can discuss it. And he would wait for us to speak. Because he's right. God's word is powerful. And it doesn't matter which part we read. There is something there that can challenge us. There is something there that can comfort us. There is something there that can bring us peace. There is something there that can grow us. If the Bible is God's word, all of it, then it's always going to come through for you. Isaiah 55 says, So as my word goes out of my mouth, it will not return to me empty but will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purposes for which I sent it. God's word is not come back empty. You will not be wasting your time reading the Bible, drawing closer to God. Take that time today. Take that time this week to get into God's word and to allow it to penetrate your soul. Allow it to change you to be more like Christ. Do yourself the best favor you could ever do. Something that no self-help book and no talk show and no podcast will ever tell you to do. Reflect on the meaning of Scripture. Reflect on it. Plant yourself by streams of living water. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is readily available that it is free, that we live in a country where it's encouraged, where we have access to it, all of it, an entire Bible, your word, available to us every day. Lord, may we be people of this book, of these words. May they continue to challenge us, grow us. May these words continue to penetrate our hearts and change us. May we hear Jesus' words, and not just hear them, but do them them into practice to be wise disciples, disciples who plant themselves by streams of living water. Lord, give us a hunger and a thirst for these words. May they be to us a wellspring of life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Amen. Let's stand together and sing with our song.